So for today's uh, speaker, we have Laura. And thanks to everybody for coming on Wednesday morning. Um, so just a little bit of background. I know we all know Laura pretty well. But uh, so she, she got her PhD in physics in 1987 from Johns Hopkins University. And her postdoc research was in the field of quantum optics. Um, she did some work at NIST, and she actually entered the field of atmospheric science with the STX Corporation as part of the NASA Goddard TOMS ozone processing team. And then she joined NCAR in 1992, uh, worked on the Moppet retrieval algorithms, and since then she's moved on to work with stratospheric water vapor and ozone, UTLS transport, and she has worked on a number of field campaigns using the NSF GV research aircraft since 2005. And today she's going to talk about the, the new field campaign. Yeah, thank you, Sasha. So um, the talk today is I've talked with a number of times in a different ways. It's the first time since the proposal has been um, approved to talk in this entirety. So I plan to cover the, you know, first the scientific background, campaign planning status, and the, the opportunities for our people. And, and some introduce some international community and collaborations uh, at large. So I want to start this uh, from uh, this picture of the, the perfect storm, why this Asian monsoon process is such a perfect storm. So we all know uh, Asia, Asia right now is the most polluted region in the world. Okay. Over this polluted region in the world, we have this large system that happens in summer that, that from the surface level, you have the low-level monsoon jet cross the equator um, uh, southerly jet, push the ITCZ to the edge of the uh, Tibetan Plateau. And uh, then from there, it starts the ascending branch of the Hadley cell. And uh, in that way, they, br they brought a lot of stuff up all the way to upper troposphere, lower stratosphere and form this large pattern. This pattern is at 16.5 kilometer satellite data. And of HCN is a biomass burning tracer. And this influential science paper is worked by a um, large number of people in this group, in this uh, room, that's uh, led by Bill Randall, and uh, Mi Jiang, and Louisa, and, uh, and Doug Kinison all contributed to this work. It's a very influential work. So this large pattern, chemical pattern, not just in one species. So uh, following the years of um, uh, Bill and Mi Zhang's work, there are many species of people in many different ways showing that. So I'm only showing some satellite picture to show um, MLS carbon monoxide water vapor and Michel Santi recently uh, published a highlighted paper to show how many species that has this pattern at 100 millibar level. Okay, so uh, in addition to the satellite gas signature, we have also known there is a large aerosol signature. This aerosol signature was first discovered from Calypso. So this is a, a curtain altitude uh, versus uh, longitude pattern and uh, showing um, the over the Asian monsoon region. Then that eventually showed us a map from SAGE data showing the, the large aerosol enhancement. So that aerosol layer is being named uniquely as the Asian travel pulse aerosol layer, ATAL. So the satellite pattern eventually is being verified by in situ measurement from a sensor called PAPS. I will talk about more about that later. So this profile is the PAPS instrument of the number concentration uh, from a location around the Tibetan Plateau um, from the, our colleagues at the uh, Institute of Atmospheric Physics in Chinese Academy of Science using the PAP sensor. So um, then we studied the dynamical signature, uh, dynamical structure of the region, and we know this region of the um, uh, Asian monsoon, summer monsoon, is the region had the highest travel pulse. So this high travel pulse for the season it's a very different configuration than the, the winter season. Then this high travel pulse made a, largely contributed to all those bullseye pattern we saw. That is in this region in summer, you have a bubble of troposphere air sitting on top at a higher level than you know, rest of the world. 
and the trope is lower than that. So this unique structure creates another type of transport that is usually we think troposphere get into stratosphere largely from tropics, equatorial regions, and ascending into stratosphere. But in summer, because of this, we have um, not only a signature of low water vapor, this is water vapor, um, three years of seasonal uh, structure and the latitude structure. And usually we focus on the low water vapor. We see the equatorial Western Pacific dehydration. But in this case, we also see the signature of the Asian monsoon hydration in a way. And in the higher latitude, this is not traditional equatorial region. And that's because this structure of Asian monsoon travel pause being higher than equatorial for this region, uh, for this season, that allow isentropically um, from the troposphere bubble into the rest of the stratosphere. And we call it bypassing, potential bypassing equatorial uh, travel pause. So that's why this HCN cross section, also in that same paper, is a very unique in showing HCN as a tracer, as a chemical uh, compound. It has a sink in the, in the tr tropical ocean. So you can see the low signature. Um, don't get my cursor. Low signature in equatorial um, latitude. Then you see the high signature in the Asian monsoon um, that that go into the stratosphere. So this is a unique transport pathway. So from all of this study, really is a starting of a new area of composition research or Asian monsoon or monsoon research, because traditionally for hundreds of years, monsoons being studied as a weather pattern for the wind, for the rain, for what's falling down. And from this study, we realize not just what's falling down, it's what is going up. It's also important. And what is redistributing a single region's emission is also important. So that's why this is a new area of research um, in recent years sponsored by, uh, co-sponsored co by Spark um, and IGAC, this two large international science organization had an activity called ACAM, this atmosphere composition of Asian monsoon. So within the ACAM, I will talk more. There are different areas of research, but there is a large component uh, driven by the satellite observations and for the UTLS science. So these science, including the dynamic and transport, we talked about the unique pathway and the passing equatorial travel paths. Then there's a chemical imp impact that we still don't know. And so we think about maybe the short-lived species will be um, going up in the elevator and impact the ozone chemistry in UTLS. And also the new evidence of <clears throat> the impact on the um, oxidizing capacity I'll mention later. Then there's also a significant possibility of climate coupling that through the short-lived species, short-lived climate forces uh, like methane and the black carbon, then the stratosphere water vapor, and the, the aerosol we mentioned, and the trial pulse level series that we haven't talked about. So these work right now are making people making progress. And the, the, the first, we think, the uh, significant breakthrough is this paper by Yu et al. at the PNAS um, 2017. So Peng Fei is in the room, and Brian Tung, um, the you know the the lead scientist of the CESM Karma model, did the simulation. In this simulation, that um, the model show the Asian monsoon. So what this is, this is a latitude. This is a month, and the highlights are the percentage of the aerosol get into stratosphere in terms of its surface area density. So you can see a very high percentage, like 50%, in the summer season then um, migrates to higher latitude. So the conclusion is overall annual average is a 15% of aerosol in the stratosphere uh, surface area uh, column coming from, contributed by the Asian monsoon. So that's a very strict, uh, significant. So I want to say a few more words about POPs because part of the credibility of this PNAS paper is because we have um, the very first three profiles 
from Pub's instrument launched from the Toilet Plot Hole that is being modeled by a karma and showed agreement of simulating this structure. And the power of the sensors is a very small sensor. Okay, so de de developed a, a few years ago by our colleague uh, at NOAA, uh, CSD, and Ruxian Gao. And the small sensor, as showed here, this is a ball pen. And um, it's very light, it can be launched from regular uh, uh, radio sound balloon. Then it, it's going to play a big role in the uh, ECLIP campaign. So the importance of in situ measurement was highlighted in this particular sensor and further realized by the community that to really understand what is the, the mechanism and what is the, the stuff being pumped out, we need to do in situ measurement campaign. But this region is very difficult to get in. So the history many people in the room know, and some maybe not know, is that um, a few years ago, from 2010, NASA, NSF, and the NRL Naval Research Lab jointly planned a campaign called the Seekers to have three aircraft and deploy it in Southeast Asia, and a very big part of the study this. And then the, the political instability in Thailand that was supposed to be the base caused the, the, the last minute cancellation of the campaign. So eventually it rescoped and rescheduled to be in US. Then after that, our European colleagues has tried a few things. And one of them is called OMO experiment. And that also had a hard time getting into India and Bangladesh tried all of that. Eventually, uh, did the transit flow, the flight, and um, based in, in Indian Ocean. And nevertheless, they had a flight called a little piece of the air mass coming out of this big H monsoon cyclone. And this is what happened. So, what the data showed is there's a very large gradient as soon as you cross the edge of the only cyclone, and many things enhanced. So there's a um, um, method enhancement, and there's um, um, no NOI enhancement, there's a particle a number concentration enhancement, and uh, then there um, uh, SO2, and it just everything changed. It's a very distinct air mass. Um, then from that campaign, they have published one highlighted paper on the OH, the unique OH, uh, behavior in the region um, by use latitude um, just fairly recently. So the next one is uh, the Stratoclim group. It's a, a European Union uh, joined, many countries joined a large project to do a campaign for this Asian monsoon region. And they started trying many years. They tried to go 2015 and it delayed, 2016 delayed. 2017 almost going to uh, be not working, eventually worked out to have 2017 based from uh, Kathmandu, center of that uh, uplifting region. And I did eight successful flight using this Mach 55 called the geophysical aircraft. And this eight science flight um, found excellent, outstanding um, result and in everything they measured. So they had a um, CN and aerosol uh, number, number concentration is that the scientists would say it's an order magnitude larger than anything they have seen in the past. And they had a very large amount of water vapor uh, at above the tropopause level. Then they had excellent information on aerosol and aerosol composition showing unique aerosol composition um, in this region because the unique boundary layer. So these results are in the process being um, um, published, especially some highlighted paper being submitted. So because of that, they're kind of hugging on their data pretty tight. And uh, I've seen the presentation in the science team. But other than that, so we have colleagues nice enough to send us some examples so you can see. So this is from um, DLR colleague Hans Schlager and showing the SO2 um, measurement in the region. So um, the large amount of SO2, I just want to give a comparison um, of our NOAA colleague measured SO2 over the Western Pacific 
in the UTLS. So the difference is the SO2 measurement here is a line of 100 PBT, but over the Western Pacific, outside on the cyclone, you know, at the UTLS, you only see 20 PBT. So it's a much, much more enhanced. And also, our colleague here knows the you know, um, how much like 10 to 20 PPB of NO means in the um, uh, cold point level. So it's a lot of lightning signature. So this new instrument, ERICA, uh, is a star of the campaign that is a new instrument developed to have the traditional um, AMS, the aerosol mass spectrum, and the like pumps like laser ablation to do single particle uh, com um, com uh, the composition. So it uh, worked uh, successfully is showing this two example of a single flight. You see this layer of aerosol from 10 to 15 kilometer and uh, this is the inorganic fraction and uh, this is some nitrate and sulfate fraction and this, by this instrument, this is from Stephen Borman uh, the PIA and uh, who is also going to be part of the, the ECLIP campaign. So this is also this from uh, old flights and uh, the type of particle, they identified seven different type of particles. So these are, you can see, a lot of organic, a lot of nitrate and uh, sulfate and uh, so all in the aerosol. There's a, they have more work in their data analysis that's going to be published. So. Um, what they have done is they have sampled the center of that bubble. That's very good, that's excellent. But the question is how much of that will be just in that bubble? It's a regional issue. And how much that actually shed out to the rest of the world? So that is what we're gonna do uh, using a clip campaign. That's the, the idea. We're highly complimentary and that, that uh, their result uh, motivates that we should do this outside of that region. So the, the idea that it is possible to do it and not having to deal with going into India and, uh, and um, Bangladesh is ha happened during the time when we studied the subseasonal behavior of the sound cyclone. And we realized when you see the seasonal average, you see a very big stationary like a, a chimney uh, pumping things up. When you see the subseasonal behavior, you actually seeing the oscillation and the east-west oscillation. So this is the mode people traditionally call in the you know dynamic study called the uh, Tibetan plateau mode. Then you have from our Wacom model, you see over the Tibetan plateau mode, you will see this clear uplifting all the way to boundary layer to the trial pulse level. This is a modeling work. Then you have another mode is being called the Iranian plateau <laughs> mode. In that mode, it's a very interesting. You see enhanced carbon monoxide or pollution tracer at our troposphere, but you do not have a boundary layer relevance. So clearly showing this is a east-west oscillation, the pumping up from the center you know, in the front edge of the Tibetan plateau, going up and dynamically shed out east and west. So this is the part of the, in the past, the people have done that in the potential vorticity way to show this shedding, they call the eddy shedding, this is a timeline. You can see going this is mostly west and some east, this is from early work from MIT group. And then later on, um, uh, Bill and uh, Hala Garni did this work showing the map of low PV air and then, you know, day after day having this behavior of shedding and uh, this area of Japan. So we looked at it from composition point of view. So on the left is um, a, a one day MLS data interpolating the map of carbon monoxide at 150 hectopascal. So we're seeing, you know, in a single day, you can see the Tibetan mode and the Iranian mode, and then you see another mode. We named it the Western Pacific mode. And we think this three, both mode, three mode are connected. That can be seen in this Hammer-Muller diagram and from Wacom, and this are Wacom runs um, from Doug Kinison. And you can see the carbon monoxide anomaly starting from beginning of June to end of October. So this is your Tibetan plateau, you always have high. Then you have east-west shedding and to go to, so 
dash the area is the area of Western Pacific that we can target from Japan. So this one can also be shown in this movie. It's more clear for you to see that the, the behavior of day-to-day -day oscillation and the relationship of the three mode and from the pot, um, geopotential height point of view. So these are the study make us realize we can propose a campaign to do this study from Japan. So, have to go, okay. So we did a, a pre-study using ERA interim data. This work largely done by Shang um, to study the statistical occurrence of the three mode, especially Western Pacific mode with respect to the center of downy cyclone. So this is what is showing the frequency of occurrence that is, there is a significant occurrence of the Western Pacific mode during this uh, the JJA season. And that is maybe around half of the, of the time. So then uh, last year, there was a large paper on BAMS uh, talking about the atom plateau study and had the schematics I really like. That is dynamically, the circulation pattern can be shown by this um, schematic. That is, you have this center of the anticyclone right above the Tibetan plateau. And from there, you have the monsoon Harley cell. And this is from uh, north-south. Then you have two water circulation type of pattern. Then that's really what we call this descending pattern and this ascending pattern. But this east-west oscillation in, involves both the Iranian plateau and the Western Pacific. But this dynamic pattern has been seen, and we have shown it by MLS data. Now we, ha we found that in other tracers, people have seen too. So this particular figure is showing low PV air and associated with the enhanced pan. Um, I have to, this is where this is a very bad um, map. So this is where Japan is, Western Pacific is. And this data is from long time ago. There's a CRISTA remote sensing instrument. It's a satellite sensor developed by um, our friend, um, Martin Risa and eventually flown on a space station, a space shuttle, space station, space shuttle. OK, thank you. And then uh, this is now they did the retrieval of the data recently. So I can't help to show my favorite large molecule pan. <laughs> um, that I learned it after coming to NCAR. It's like, what? You know, anyway, so I have to know uh, peroxyacetonitrate. So. Anyway, um, we also seen in MLS had a water vapor pattern. Now we start to develop a range range that is aircraft based from uh, Okinawa can sample this pattern. And then we also have Wacom model. This is a, a Mike Mills run uh, from Wacom of SO2. And all of this showing the shedding will bring these things over. Then we did a statistical study using MLS data when I say we, and Sean did this work. So um, we worked together to develop the statistics to do relative coordinate average. That is, if you take all the days that the Western Pacific mode is happening, then you uh, shift your coordinate relative to latitude and longitude of the center of this mode and average your water vapor at 100 hexapascal, your CO at 150 hexapascal, you will see this pattern. So you know statistically, when you do the dynamics, you will have very likely the chemical consequence. So all this is the basis of this proposal, um, the proposal of the campaign. And I realize that time is going pretty fast, and I have to come to the campaign now. And this campaign uh, is proposed to be uh, NSF and NASA uh, join the work. And um, um, Paul Newman is my um, co-PI for the NASA side. And we have Elliot uh, led the chemistry, and the Bill led dynamics, and the Brian led the uh, aerosol composition. Then we had a large group of colleagues to coordinate all kind of activity. So Rushan Gao is going to coordinate the ground-based measurement. Michel Santee is going to coordinate satellite, and uh, Stephen Borman, 
and the Mark, uh, Marcus Rex going to relate these to stratoclin and aerosol measurement, and the master Tomo Fujiwara is going to be the Japan uh, science team lead. I will show all of this later. So um, the campaign is uh, eventually decided to be uh, July, end of July to uh, August for six weeks in 2020, and the. The plan, the agreement with the NASA is if the NSF proposal going through the OFAC process work out to be reviewed well, NASA will work on supporting B-57 without additional proposal. That's what the agreement was. So I will talk about the status. So only very recently, we have gotten the final approval uh, in terms of the PI request for money funding uh, from NSF. And so we're going to target these things I've talked about, so transport, chemical content, aerosol, and water vapor are the focuses. So this is the map of operation. Uh, because the government shut down, we missed the first target to do site survey to finalize the base in March. So right now, the intention is going in May. We have to see there are a lot of conflict, you know, G20 happening in Japan, and the emperor is changing in the beginning of May. So there's just a lot of things that make it hard to, to actually decide when to go. So right now, we're hypothesizing we have two possible bases. One is going to be on Okinawa, the other in southern Japan. They have a very similar range range that the, the, the Cyan is the B-57 flight range, a uh, nominal range, and the purple is the G-5 range. And they will cover seven, um, um, we call it first flight information region, that's the ATC ground um, control. So we have seven including possibility to going near Vietnam and to have the South Asia profile and versus the shedding in Western Pacific for downwind influence and a lot of the institute. So, so these, um, conceptually, the two aircraft can work together in such fashion that G5, um, in this case, would be able to capture large part of the shedding layer based on our model, um, that's the blue, uh, vertical profiles and uh, flying in Japan, we have done that over a contrast campaign. Uh, it's a very, very, very difficult to go up and down because the heavy air traffic and the, the very tight region and a very um, tight control. When you're over the ocean, you don't have radar, uh, they cannot give you room to go up and down. So we rarely will go up and down, but we will because we need to know the local boundary layer and the vertical extent of the shedding, then aim to go mostly above the air traffic and to stay at the G5's highest level. And then the B-57 will fly the crossing the troll pause. So this is, uh, so far we're going on to the science team now. So the G5 payload and investigators uh, uh, consist largely a uh, lot of people in the room and will have the fast ozone and the NONO why or no two, we haven't decided um, which one, so Andy Warhammer and the team. Okay, now that we just list one name for the lead PI. Then we'll have a new instrument, and uh, Teresa gave me this picture of this new instrument, and um, Teresa and, uh, and Frank worked on this Aerodyne. New CEO also have an N2O instrument. We hope that it will be configured and make it into the plane. Then we have the Picaro, the four channel, but mostly for its CEO and the Methan. And then we have um, Georgia Tech uh, colleague Greg Huey doing the GT Sims. We mostly ask for SO2 and um, HCL, but he's offering, offering uh, uh, quite a few other species to be measured in his proposal. Um, then we have Toga, we have Iwas, and uh, you, know, you know Eric and, uh, and Elliot. And then we have water vapor. Then we have the harp uh, from, from the SAM or ACOM group. Then the aerosol uh, is largely later on being supported by NOAA colleagues and uh, um, uh, Chuck Brock's group and uh, Christina Williamson will, will let this NMAS in cabin aerosol spectrometer, uh, the size distribution, um, then the USS. Um, in cabin, because we, uh, REF's use as is the wind pod measurement, sometimes in the high altitude they're challenging, so we have in cabin one to cover the range. Then we'll have um, NOAA uh, SP2 for black carbon, and we'll have the Stratoclin uh, Erica, uh, Stephen Borman's group is working 
um, very hard to integrate that to the G5 regs. And uh, we have our government shutdown decision delay. So by now, we haven't given them a reg, but they're going to come for test flight later this year or early next year. Then we have some uh, standard cloud and uh, temperature sensor. So for BPD-7, now this is the time to say a few words about BPD-7 status. So because the NASA process, there was a large competition of EVS last year, so the decision cannot be made until after. So end up after the collaboration group with us did not get selected. So it has to be fun funded outside the EVS process, and that process needs time. And so all this, uh, so I had a good chat with the Tanjax yesterday. Uh, he made it very clear that it is his plan to support B57 to come forward. And but he does need to wait at least another couple of weeks um, because the NASA budget target has not come down. So he need to get received that target. And he said that this B57 cost is on the radar screen, screen of Jack K and a lot of people in the room know these people. So although he's, he can't guarantee this point, but it's fairly promising this is going to happen. The difficulty is the time uh, will not allow um, a lot of people to, to work on additional funding they can bring in from other agencies. So people are very antsy about that. So at the proposal phase, we have these people involved. That's, uh, you know, Paul Newman as the lead person. We have Hoare Sampler from Elliot and uh, Noah um, Water Vapor and SO2 uh, from Troy and Drew, and we have um, NASA people will work on the similar air, um, aerosol number spectral uh, distribution. And we have water vapor and a standard state parameter. And the CUFC's group is going to do the COCO2 and the, um, NOAA's SP2 additional copy will be doing black carbon. And we have the palm instrument from Dan Murphy's group. Um, then additional gathered instrument want to get on, and we have meteorologists want to get involved. And in addition to these, we have uh, other co international colleagues are very, very eager to get on B57 because this supported instrument will only feel half full. So Hans Schlager from DLR uh, offered to come to Metro and no one know why on B57. And then Martin Kramer um, offered to come to Metro Series Cloud, and um, Adam. Uh, uh, Barrasso, our Canadian colleague, has two outstanding new remote sensor measuring curtains of aerosol and the water vapor. Hope to get a Canadian Space Agency support to come on B57. So all this is ongoing. These are the the piece right now. It's not not solid solidified. So we need to work on. So we also have a very large component of ground-based measurement. So ground-based measurement. Um, overall, from international colleagues, will be coordinated by Rushan, and the, the, the NSF component is led by our CEO, CEO uh, colleagues and uh, Lars and uh, Doug. I think at least Doug is in the room. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so they have been uh, the proposal have been approved to uh, do measurement balloon launch co-located with the aircraft with our G5. So they have uh, pops and they have water vapor and some additional sensors. So in addition, we have other locations. We have Western Pacific location from our German colleague. We have Tibetan Plateau location from our Chinese colleague. We have a suite of things from Japan. I will talk later. So we also need to have a good, a strong theory and modeling team. And right now, the investigator involved in the proposal phase, um, led by Brian Tung from the CEO, and I did the modeling work. And this is extended work from Peng Fei's work uh, using Karma and showing this aerosol layer as uh, you know, altitude and uh, longitude uh, averaged for that latitude region. And uh, showing that in the over the Tibetan Plateau, this layer is fairly high and over 16 kilometers. But it's, it's um, uh, collapsing down toward the region we're sampling. Um, then we also had a, a lot of uh, ACOM, WACOM group have contributed to pre-study. I've shown a few figures. I will show more, mostly from Doug and uh, Mike Neal and uh, Simona Tilms. And now it's time we talk for in additional 
investigators' interest. So that's uh, largely the, the motivation for this talk to uh, invite our ACOM colleagues to uh, be interested in participating, contributing. So we have, I understand we have a CSM2 ICOM that has um, a lot of the, the state-of-art aerosol, uh, including secondary organic aerosol production in the model, and it's time to um, maybe um, to use this as a test phase, test base to see how well the model is working as part of forecast. So we, we need a good uh, suite of models doing aerosol forecast. Um, then we have possibility of a work model with tracers and uh, uh, to see the convective lifting from the center region. And we also hope people are interested in seeing the um, chemical data simulation model run and how that um, compare. I will talk more about this, but uh, we have new trouble me data. We have our satellite people involved, maybe interested in looking into it. And we also have um, uh, people from Asian um, community interested in collaborating with us to provide better emission inventory, potentially to uh, help us get uh, the emission right. So we have scheduled an ACOM discussion, and it will be coordinated by Louisa and Becky. I hope they agree. This is a, we have had a few emails and uh, to coordinate with the GIS time to be in uh, April 11th, Thursday morning. We're going to email on that again soon. Um, so we did a lot of pre-study, but I'm going to just go really fast, not spending time on. Basically, just use trajectory model to see uh, if we do sample in this region and how things will go afterward and where things are coming from based on trajectory model. So then we also saw where they hit the boundary layer and how long it takes for this trajectory, back trajectory to hit the boundary layer. I know I'm going really fast because there are other things I want to show you. So then we want to see if we sample in this region, go forward, how long does it take, how much of these parcels will go into stratosphere and where. And a lot of these um, are being done. And the foremost, we're looking into our Wacom model to see how well it can forecast this region. So this is the forecast run uh, from Simona. It's 150 hectopascal uh, carbon monoxide uh, for 2017. So I'm not going to let the movie run to the end. I will just show you. Um, then we did a, a quick comparison. How do how did I make it go? Um, OK. So this is a selected day from this Wacom run. This is the, that same day from MLS. So MLS, um, we had a, it's a very sparse measurement, a few tracks. We have the heavily fuel and interpolate to get this picture. So I just want to show you. So this is two, two different days, Wacom and MLS, when the Western Pacific mode is happening. And this is Wacom and MLS. So you can see, so dynamically, um, you know, everybody get the dynamics, but the composition may be different, you know, depending on how well the emission, how well the convection is represented. But overall, there is sufficient amount of consistency to show this is happening. So we need to look at this further. So then we also know that ACOM has a new um, project called Musica, and the, the idea is how we connect a different scale of modeling. So this is a musical slide from Mary and, and Bill. And the idea is if we could use a work model to represent the, the convection in the region and uh, combine with that to do the shedding right, right? So I don't know where the status is and how soon that become um, ready for field test, right? So I added here in this one, you know, hopefully if we have some aerosol component into that, it would be great. So uh, I'm moving on some quickly, some practical things. So uh, to prepare 2020, there's a lot of things we'll do to, uh, this year. So first thing we want to do is the site survey to decide where the base is. So there are a number of considerations um, to why we use Okinawa or why we use the southern Japan. And we have to do a site survey and a moral study to decide. So the um, problem with uh, Okinawa is really expensive, and um, we also 
try to stay away from military base, and there is a civilian base we need to do site survey for. Um, the problem with uh, southern Japan is um, uh, we actually overlap with the Tokyo 2020 Olympic. So there are going to be a lot of air traffic issue, and potentially we can avoid if we start from there. So all these considerations going on. So there's right now uh, eliminated all the other possibilities. The three still like possible airport in southern Japan, and we may further eliminate to see which one will potent. Now we only heard yesterday uh, it's highly likely we have 57, so we need two hangars. So then all this stuff need to be figured into. So another thing is the forecast dry run we need to do uh, in this year's July, August time period. So we're going to be start talking about that soon. So we want to see who, which model will participate, and um, um, the CSM2, or and we have some Japanese colleagues offer to do that. Um, and I think Doug has a has a latest implemented CSM2, right? You you have comments for that? Yeah. Well, we have a, we just added. A, Yeah. So we, we welcome everybody's interest in participating in this forecast dry run. And in the past, the, the you know, Western Pacific campaign, and Dago is one of the chemical forecaster. I know Mary and Luisa have a lot of experience doing chemical forecast. And so, and Simone has a lot of forecast runs. And now that ACOM has a very large website presence of the forecast, and also the satellite people potentially can look at the near real-time data and see. I know uh, Sarah has found a signature in, in uh, mapping the data, and there's just a lot of stuff I hope people think about as we can talk in April. Um, so one possibility is I will show after this, we have a very strong Japanese collaboration. And they have done a lot of homework. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in a meeting in Japan, and the team, several team members showed their, what they like to contribute. So this particular one is the aerosol, ground-based aerosol LIDAR from Fukuoka, the depolarization ratio. So they uh, think these are potentially related to ATEL. And they, they have some, you know, how much is what component, and um, so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go into detail. So. Uh, I'm not totally educated on how feasible this is, because there are a lot of days um, they will have cloud. They can't do this. So I'll be looking into that more. Uh, so I'm only throwing this out as a possibility that we can forecast and ask them to look at their LIDAR, and, uh, and even some ground-based testing of their instrument. So as part of the for, uh, forecast dry run, uh, we'll talk more. and. Uh, so I want to move on to our international collaboration. So the Japanese proposal is very large. They submitted the proposal last year. They're waiting to hear result in April. And the, they said the success rate of all this uh, uh, JSPS proposal overall is 20%, but they are very optimistic because it's a very large international collaboration. And they have a total of 11 PIs participating from eight different institutions. So they're... Um, they have a commercial aircraft measurement program called Contrail, and the PI, the person, gave a really outstanding talk um, two weeks ago, and talked about what their interest and the potentially co-located flight and what they can contribute, and so the adding basically in a way they're adding aircraft to it, and then they have ground-based lidar in two locations: the Fukuoka in southern Japan and Tsukuba in the northern Japan. Then they have a number of sites that are going to do balloon launch of their developing sensors and the very interesting sensors added to potentially serious cloud study. And they have modeling people bringing two models they're interested in and the data simulation models. They're, they're Japanese high resolution data simulation models. They're interested in participating in forecast. These are the people, so we know many of them. And the Masatomo Fujiwara from um, um, uh, Okay, uh, Hokkaido University is the PI, and uh, we uh, know Masato Shiatani here is going to be participating, looking at their satellite data, and um, then their modelers bring in um, 
their forecast model. I don't know if you guys know these models, the ACTM and the Spring Terrace. Um, then there are additional theory dynamic people like to participate studying the dynamics. So I want to show very quickly a couple of slides from them because it's really interesting. So they have done this from Indonesia experiment. So what they do is they have a balloon led a small drone with the aerosol sensor all the way up to 20 kilometer. Then they, they let the drone uh, glide down and they plan to do this off, they already identified the island of the southern Japan uh, uh, Fukuoka region. There, there they can do this experiment and then capture their drone by a boat. So they had all this planned out and more planned than we are, and they had a different compositions from the past experiment. Uh, these are Professor Hayashi, and he has done um, uh, these things in Antarctica and a number of places. Very interesting. And um, in addition to that, we have a large Chinese proposal, which has been funded. So they are going to be launching from five different sites over Tibetan Plateau. And each side with this four sensors, including the aerosol uh, number distribution pops and the water vapor. And they plan, they have proposed and got enough funding to monitor the seasonal evolution over the Tibetan Plateau, starting from May all the way to September. And be intense, more intense during our flight time and potentially doing trajectory match and so on and so forth. So, so this, as I kind of summarizing this by saying, um, this emerging focus uh, of monsoon study as a part of the international community uh, activities being discussed in last year's um, Spark General Assembly in Kyoto, and it was actually part of the newsletter. And because people realize now, uh, the WCRP, which is a, a world climate research program, um, uh, had a four different components for ocean, atmosphere, and um, um, ice, and, um, and the water cycle, and so on. So they all have an interest in monsoon study in different ways. So then people realize how monsoon really couples the weather and the climate and the ocean and the land, tropics, extra tropics, and the troposphere, stratosphere, and the precipitation and the composition. So, and the discussion is going on how we use this as a centerpiece to link into different area study. So from that perspective, uh, this Spark IGAC uh, activity uh, called ACOM, and um, uh, Jim Cropper and myself uh, started by um, leading this uh, project, this activity. Uh, now that the new leadership transition into Mian Qin in Gadar and Hanschlager in DLR, and has been working on this basically to use this monsoon as a centerpiece to link how the emission air quality, you know, had a couple to the climate in the region, and the aerosol cloud. So this is a nice figure showing how aerosol and cloud interaction can feed back the human activity to monsoon behavior itself. Then there's upper troposphere activities we talked about. So this activity actually is precursor by the seekers planning. So seekers planning, a historical event for me uh, to be involved the seeker actually happened in Lhasa, Tibet, when we had a very, myself, very first workshop on Asian monsoon and stratosphere troposphere exchange. This workshop, uh, you can recognize Eric Jensen is somewhere, and I have Andrew somewhere, um, and there's Jim Crawford, and um, there was Bill Mijiang, and there's a number of uh, European colleagues, um, and a lot of Chinese colleagues. This is the first workshop, and we went to a newly opened Tobacco Observatory. Um, then, since then, we have had a biannual ACOM workshop, then started with Kathmandu, and uh, uh, later in Bangkok, then 2017 in Guangzhou. And now I want to advertise my last slide that the fourth ACOM workshop is going to be happening this year in Kuala Lumpur. So the UKM is a suburb, it's not exactly Kuala Lumpur. Um, there is still a chance, the registration deadline is on March 31st. And it's a not very expensive as international trip because the local expense is very low. And that this is an opportunity for you to meet a lot of local colleagues and establish collaboration 
and we are going to present the finalized or near finalized uh, uh, ECLIB plan and uh, do discussions with working groups on how local people. Um, last time in 2017, I talked about the possibility of this plan. There are already a lot of people jumping up to say, you know, can I do this? And so uh, Claire um, Preber Patra was a scientist of, you know, originally from India, working in Japan. He was then started planning to bring him out to do forecast. And uh, Sachiko Hayashida also applied for a large project supported by Japan and doing Indian regions sampling and uh, want to be part of this. So there's a lot of opportunities. Anyway, um, pretty fast to run through. So to give people some time <laughs> to ask questions before 11. Yeah. yeah. So if the uh, WB, WB57 flies, um, is there any chance they'll put an halogen, inorganic halogen instrument on? <laughs> I think the, the halogen instrument is going to be on ER2 at that time. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> so there's there you say. So the, the intention of WB57 payload is not to uh, have proposal additional funded instrument. It, they are mostly instrument already being supported by Kanjak's routine program. So I don't think that includes halogen instruments. OK. Yeah. Uh, are there any plans for mid-latitude uh, uh, balloon launch? Because this will be a great opportunity for study tropics, tropical mid-latitude interactions. Uh, the, the, the launch is mostly what we, you know, composition focused, a series co focused. But the, if you are you talking about the regular radio sounds, right? Yeah. yeah. So the the there I don't think we have so transport necessarily related to these dynamical processes. So the standard network maybe will be used for analysis by people, but we do not sponsor additional uh, sensors other than you know what I have shown. Yeah. Laura, have you been uh, speaking with our Korean colleagues? Because the end of this year, hopefully, we'll see the launch of the GEMS geostationary atmospheric composition satellite, which will take incredible atmospheric composition data every hour and four kilometers over the whole region. And so, next, uh, but next year as well, there's a, they're going to have a lot of uh, different validation campaigns <coughs> going on. So they're trying to coordinate a lot of ground-based monitoring especially of remote sensing instruments from the ground. So that would be an interesting thing to that, tie that's, into. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent one. I, I actually have talked to the two people about the GEMS possibility before. But that didn't make it into my slide. When I wrote the travel homie, you know, it was a lot of things I was thinking. That was, I thought of something else. I also talked with the Kathy Claiborne. Because the Yazi instrument right now is the only one we have published a paper to show they're showing the shedding signature in the upper troposphere. So we hope there will be a lot of the collaborations with the satellite community, and hopefully, you know, your group will help with that. That's a, that's the idea. And I talked to the G1, uh, who was our postdoc now working in Japan, about the possibilities of gems validation with it. Place to go. Uh -huh. Just to, as much as anything to tie in with all their validation activities, which are going to be, it's going to be a big effort next year. Yeah, so he's going to be at ACOM workshop. We're going to, yeah, the very good point. I didn't make it into my slide. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Um, so about the NO, NOY, or NO, NO2. Uh, choice is that the, I would vote for an OI measurement. In fact, I would uh, I'd be actually more interested in see if we can do a gas phase and the particle and uh, So two channels, is it possible? Well, thank you. Then would 
people comment from ACOM? And I, this is something we want to be doing in discussion from initial discussion between me and Elliot. That's the same as our sense. But I'd like to hear from our, our colleagues here, and Andy and Frank, and, uh, and Brian was here. And uh, so what do you all think? Yeah, But nevertheless, we can measure gas based on OI. Choose to measure NO and OI versus yeah. NO2, right? That's. But it depends on what you know, the science team agrees on, what should be done. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't mean you couldn't poison it with one of them. Yeah. You'd, you'd have to figure out how to, how to do that. And, and in that stuff, is, at this point, it's impossible to get certified. In Not for particle in OI, but the gas phase in OI, we can yeah, do it. That's, that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's specific. It's not like we can't measure in OI, but to have the particle phase is a problem. Yeah. We got a few more minutes. So okay. Yeah, we have another okay. meeting. So yeah, we, we got the there. research reports. Okay, so thanks. Let's thank uh, Laura one more time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.